Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, that we may walk in His paths. The nation's Ninth of Av invites you to join us in the conversation of Christians and Jews walking together in fulfillment of God's covenant promises. Well, welcome to another interview portion from Nations Ninth of Av. Our guest this time, all the way from Israel, is Gidon Ariel, uh, founder and director of Root Source. Gidon, welcome to the program. Shalom, Al, and hello, everybody out there in recorded uh, video land. Yeah. Uh, now, where exactly do you live in Israel? I live in a small community called Ma'alei Hever. We're about 10 minutes south of Hebron, and I've been living here for about seven years. And before that, I lived in, we lived, my family lived in the Ma'ale Adumim, which is about 15 minutes uh, northeast of Jerusalem, down on the road towards Jericho and the Galilee. Uh, now, the, the city of Hebron, or Hebron, as I learned growing in, um, it's one of the it's one of those ancient cities. It's the city of the patriarchs. The tomb of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is there. Yes. And one thing that I see frequently about Hebron is how dangerous it is to go there and how dangerous it is for the Jewish community there because you're surrounded by a hostile Arab population. How Tell us the truth about that, because that's the impression that we get just from the news. No, 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 no. I don't know what news you're watching. And there's not to, and, uh, but uh, first of all, my own children and the children of my neighbors uh, learn elementary school in Hebron. And there are about 100 families who live, Jewish families that live in Hebron, and they walk down, and their kids walk down the street all the time. And uh, uh, 50,000 uh, Jews come two or three times a year uh, to the city of Hebron in some of the biggest tourist uh, events in Israel annually. Uh, so to, to say dangerous and Hebron in the same, in the same sentence uh, makes my eyelids go up. Uh, I, I think that I, I, we... we uh, Let's put it this way. The fact is, is that there are many Tel Avivians who think that Jerusalem is unsafe. And there are many Jerusalemites who think that Gush Etzion is unsafe. And the people in Gush Etzion think that Hebron is unsafe. Everybody has to just overcome this irrelevant and uh, irrational fear and uh, go where somebody else can say, come on, if I invite you somewhere, then... You, if you trust me, and you should trust me because I trust myself, then come on over, and you'll be, and you will have multiple uh, value and benefit from overcoming that fear. First of all, the very overcoming of fear—you're a, a former army guy, right? Yes, I am. Good. I always, I always, you see, here in Israel, the army, the navy, and the air force are all under the army. So if I say somebody's in the army, then, then if they're from the Navy, they're not going to get all upset. But I know that if I, by mistake, tell yes, somebody, are you from the army? They go, no, no, well, I'm not from the army, I'm from the Navy. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, the, the, uh, what was my point over here? The, the idea of, of the fact that we feel confident and we've overcome our fears, that in itself is a giant win. And of course, then when you do come here, it's, a very, very exciting story that you're walking in the footsteps of. So uh, people, and I've, I've uh, hosted countless uh, guests here in my home and in Hebron, and uh, people, nobody uh, ever told me, oh, what a waste of time. I should have just kept on being afraid. <laughs> so uh, I'm very pleased. We'll be talking about it more later that last year, and hopefully this year, uh, the Ninth of Av uh, Israel tour will be, will come to my home and will come to Hebron, and uh, yeah, they got a lot out of it. I, you know, everybody can say for themselves it was the best, the best part of their tour, but I think it usually is. Well, that's exactly why I asked the question. Uh, I have not had the pleasure, the blessing of visiting Hebron yet, mm -hmm. but it is uh, a place I very much want to see. And what you have just said is 
what we often hear um, about Israel, there are, there are irrational fears about going to Israel at any time. You know, it's, right. it's, it's terribly unsafe. There's terrorist activity. Oh, mm -hmm. no, it's probably safer in Israel than it is in certain places in the United right. States. Well, it's definitely, not probably, yeah. definitely. Quite uh, well uh, documented. Right. And as you have uh, said, there's such a blessing there in overcoming the fear and coming yes. to the land that uh, the Bible tells us God cares for. Amen. So, uh, so let's, let's get a little bit of your story as in how did you come to Israel? Um, what, what brought you to make Aliyah and when did you? Okay, let's see how much of my story I will uh, share here. I was born in New York, uh, which uh, was a very Jewish community, of course. Uh, even though my, my family was not very observant uh, growing up, I still went to an Orthodox Jewish day school. Uh, my mother was a teacher there, so she probably got a... Uh, uh, a, a, a what you call a, a, a rebate on the on the tuition or something like that, maybe I don't know. But uh, like many of my uh, school uh, uh, friends, my chums, we weren't religious at home. But then in in uh, sixth in fifth grade, my parents took me out of the Jewish school and put me into into um, public school, maybe because by then certainly my mother had stopped teaching, so maybe the, the tuition was a little bit too high, I don't, I don't know. But in fifth grade, I then realized that uh, this whole idea of a Jewish identity is something that I don't want to let just pass me by. I want to take it much more seriously. So that's when I uh, made the conscious de decision to be uh, a more um, uh, Jewish identifying person. Uh, more observant of the the religion of uh, Judaism, and uh, and I, I wasn't sure what it was yet, but I, I wanted to be part of it. And luckily uh, for me, in sixth grade, when I, my parents agreed to let me go back to that Jewish day school, I was introduced to Bnei Akiva, which is a Jewish Zionist youth movement, and uh, I just simply fell in love. I loved going to this uh, youth group. And uh, just one second, Aniba Aniba Aklatapo. I loved being with the, my peers and with my uh, counselors who were just slightly older than me. And I started uh, falling in love with what they had to teach. And what they had to teach was the love of the God of Israel, the love of the Torah of Israel, the love of the people of Israel and the love of the land of Israel, and the love of the state of Israel. This was in the mid to late 70s. We're talking about the 1970s. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and really, that was only a mere 20, 30 years after the state of Israel was founded. And it was barely 10 years after the Six-Day War and the, uh, the um, redemption of the city of Jerusalem. So uh, this was all exciting stuff, even for a 10-year-old, so, uh, or a little bit. So uh, th th this kind of stuff was, was really exciting to me, and I loved hanging out in the, this Zionist uh, Jewish youth movement uh, clubhouse. Spent more time there in my own home. And in ninth grade, I was already in a Jewish high school, and my, uh, it wasn't so good, and my parents and I decided that we would sit down and, and try to figure out what I would do for 10th grade. And my parents surprised me and said, you don't have you ever thought of going to Israel for high school. <clears throat> so uh, I jumped at the chance and uh, I haven't looked back. I, w I came here for 10th grade. This was about 42 years ago, I think, 43, something like that. <clears throat> and... Um, and uh, I, I went to high school here. I uh, got to know dozens and hundreds of other kids in my high school. And I went to the B'nai Akiva branch here in Jerusalem and made uh, lifelong friends there. Then I went 
to the Army here and the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces. I was in the tank corps, and so I made lifelong friends there also. And so Israel, not only is it like a family, it's really a whole bunch of friends. It's a much smaller country, and there are a lot more opportunities to interact with strangers, and you're not strangers in the first place. So uh, you just, it's just, uh, and, and you, you might be familiar with the concept of what we call degree, which means straight shooting, if you will. In other words, Americans like to bounce around the bush and, oh, how, is it, how was it? It was great. And they, you know, they have all these social niceties. Well, in Israel, we're a lot more like the uh, sabra fruit, where inside we're sweet, but outside we're rough and maybe even sharp and pokey. So that's the way it is. And, and, and people are used to that. And so you might have people yelling at each other a lot more, but you also have people helping each other a lot more. So that's the way it is here in Israel. And that's the way it is am amongst us Israelis. Hmm. Yeah. And I just loved it. And I've been here ever since. You know, Gidon, you remind me of um, when my wife and I were flying El Al from Paris to Tel Aviv. And uh, we saw that once where uh, a man was having trouble getting on the bus that took us out to the plane because there was someone standing his way at the door and <laughs> they were arguing they were yelling in french and in hebrew by the time we got to the plane they were laughing and joking <laughs> <laughs> uh and that's you know you have to uh, get into the groove, I think, with uh, with the culture, and it's such an interesting culture. I mean, you spoke of your experience coming from the United States with B'nai Akiva and going to high school. I'm sure you had people there from many other countries, and that's the fascinating thing about Israel. All of these Jews come from every continent, speak so many different languages. How do you get along? Well, that's that's a great question. It's it. it I, I, you're you're asking me on one foot over here, and uh, that that is a question that numerous books and I bet uh, doctorates have been written. How? What is the secret of uh, of the Jewish people? How do we get a, of this of the Israeli people? The you see the Jews don't have to worry about getting along so much because we're scattered all over the world. But uh, once we've brought all of, not all, unfortunately, but a, a good proportion, by now close to half of the Jews in the world live in Israel. It's a small place. It's not, it's not uh, so small that uh, there's no room. There's still plenty of room here. But uh, the, the way that we are able to get together is truly a, a, uh, a miracle. Uh, I... I, I <sighs> What can, what can I say? I'll try to give some answers. First of all, you have the, um, the, the miraculous nature of the very existence of the state of Israel. The very fact that the state of Israel was established was a big miracle. And because we're talking about a, a nation that spent 2,000 years in exile, we didn't Anybody else who would look at that would say, there's no way that these people are coming back. Not only that, um, a certain major religion even made a very big point about the fact that these Jews aren't coming back to the land of Israel is a, a proof that God hates them. God has had enough with them. So, and, and many of us came from lands of these kinds of people <laughs> So we were used to that kind of anti-Semitism. And we thought that that was just our lot. And uh, it came to a head, of course, with the, with the Holocaust, where uh, an entire third of our nation was decimated. And I, I have to tell you, it's, it's uh, a little bit... Uh, um, people don't, keep, don't think about it so much, but somebody made a, a, uh, a timeline of, the, of, of Jewish history that included in it a graph of Jewish population. So Jewish population since um, the time of the, of the Second Temple and, and even before, well, was around a million, two million, a million, three million, down there in the million-ish. And then about 100 years before uh, uh, the uh, mid-20th uh, century, it 
ballooned, like really, <laughs> it ballooned to 18 million. So within 100 years, we went from about a, a, a million or 2 million to about 18 million. And then we lost a third of that, 6 million. So we were down to 11 million, 12 million. If the Holocaust had happened 100 years before, they wouldn't have been able to kill 6 million. We were only 2 million Jews in the whole world. That's fascinating. Um, Prime Minister Netanyahu wrote a book 20 years ago called A Durable Peace. And he didn't yeah. quote that particular statistic, but he opened the book telling of a state dinner he had when he was prime minister in the 1990s, mm -hmm. a visit to China, talking to the uh, premier of China at the time about how the Indian civilization, the Chinese civilization, the Jewish civilization had given so much to the world. And the Chinese premier was astounded to know that there were only at that time 12 million Jews. He asked, why is that so? Why aren't there a billion Jews like there are Chinese and Indians? Prime right. Minister Netanyahu said, because the difference is the state of Israel. So it's there's, true. yeah, yeah. We, 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 that that, that anti-Semitism anti has been a major point, part of uh, Jewish identity really forever. We're, we're, we're recording this uh, interview just before the holiday of Passover. Yes. And uh, it, it, one, and this idea of anti-Semitism and uh, the struggle with anti-Semitism is a major theme of the Passover story. And the Passover story starts out, the, 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 the Passover Haggadah, which is the textbook which uh, traditionally Jews use, and today not only Jews, um, for their Seder, for their Passover night um, event. It's a, fa it's a family. It's, it's usually held uh, within the uh, uh, comfort of your own home. And uh, close to the beginning of the text, it says, uh, in each and every generation, um, uh, one second, it, 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 is, it is clear and true, both to us and to our forefathers, uh, uh, not only in this generation, but in every single generation, our enemies try to rise and kill us. And, uh, but God, the Holy One, blessed be He, saves us from their hands. This is the text that we read every year, every Jewish child. Uh, I'm talking about the, the, uh, um, the bell curve, there's, there's many Jews who are assimilated today, but the, the bell curve of, uh, of Jews, the people who, who their, their grandchildren are still Jews, they uh, know this, uh, this song. And, uh, not, not, and, and the, the uh, story itself starts out not only from uh, Paro, Pharaoh, who tries to destroy the Jewish people when they're still in, in, in Egypt, the story, of course, of the, of the book of Exodus. So they, they haven't even come out of the, they haven't even, become, ha, be, they have not yet even been a, uh, a, 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 an independent nation. And already they have this, uh, this built-in expectation that the world is going to kill them. That, that's all they know from. But it's not only the, 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 this Haggadah, the text of the, of, the, uh, of the Passover Seder, says it wasn't only from Pero, it was even from Laban. Laban tried to kill, according to uh, Jewish tradition, tried to kill Jacob. So, if, uh, so in other words, Jacob, he, didn't, he barely had 12 kids. We, we're not talking about a nation. We're barely talking about a, bi a big family, and already you're trying to be killed. So the idea of the Jews always uh, being on the lookout to being destroyed and decimated is part and parcel of our, D of our DNA. Now, I, but, but okay, so this was coming a long way around to say, when the state of Israel was, was established, it was a tremendous miracle that we now had a place where it would be hard, but we would be able, just like in 
the book of Esther, which we just recently learned, we would be able to stand on our own and defend ourselves. That was something that we hadn't been able to do ever since the time of the book of Esther, when you think mm. about it. True. Uh, the, that's, biblically speaking, yes, that's true. And, uh, you know, I firmly believe that the greatest evidence that there is a God is the existence of the Jewish people as a people and as the remnant of the nation of Israel. Amen. Me too. Yeah. Uh, which gets us around to what I'd like to ask of what you're doing now, uh, yes. and that would be root source. Yes. Um, you founded that close to seven years ago, was it? And how did this happen? And what do you, what's root source been doing the last few years? And before I get to that, I will continue the story of what I'm doing in Israel. Okay. So I, because it's connected, I was, uh, like I said, I was in the army in, uh, after finishing high school. I also was in a Hezder Yeshiva, which is a uh, school of advanced Jewish learning. We, I, it, was a, it was a special program that um, was combined with my army service. So for about six years, I was part of the time in the army and part of the time in the yeshiva. We would get up at five or six o'clock in the morning and go straight to the study hall. And we would study straight through till 10, 11, 12, one o'clock at night. And uh, very, very um, focused and, and impactful uh, time of my life and the lives of hundreds of thousands of, uh, of uh, Jews in Israel and around the world and in Jewish history who have uh, been lucky enough to participate in uh, such an experience. Um, I'd just like to, as a side, say that the state of Israel today, there is more study of Torah than anywhere all over the world in history probably combined. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. That's for, in case anybody's saying, oh, that that non-religious state, that's, that, that secular state, it is the, the, Israel is the biggest supporter of, of Torah study in history, state of Israel. Anyway, so there I was studying Torah and in the army, and I, had a, and I went on a vac, uh, vacation or a, a break one day, and I was walking through Jerusalem, and I saw a sign on an apartment across the street, and I crossed the street in order to read the, the sign because that's a, hobby of mine to read the street signs in Jerusalem. You know, you can get a, a bachelor's degree in Jewish history just by reading the street signs in Jerusalem. This was not a street sign. It, it was a sign of an organization, and it said ICEJ, which stands for International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. And this was uh, confusing to me and, and very surprising because embassy, of course, is a word that is synonymous with friendship and Christian at the time for me was a word that's synonymous with enemy <laughs> because uh, we as Jews, as I spent a little while now discussing, were used to the entire world being against us and growing up in the United States or in Europe for that matter, the majority, the absolute majority of uh, the people around you are Christians. Now, I'm not going into, are you Catholic or Protestant or Lutheran or Baptist? or I don't know what. You're all Christians as far as I'm concerned. And so, I, so you all, again, I'm not, I'm, obviously I'm not getting into a, a discussion here who's responsible for what, but from my perspective, everybody who's not Jewish is Christian. And everybody who's not Jewish is an enemy of the Jews. And, the, and individual Jews. And therefore, any, everybody who is Christian is an enemy. That's a simple A plus B, A plus B equals C. Now again, I, I'm growing up in, in New York in the 20th century, so it's not like uh, every few years we have a pogrom or something like that, but we all learned about that kind of stuff. We're, we're, in other words, it's, it's there, not very deep in our psyche, not, not very uh, uh, hidden underground. Yet here was an organization that says, no, we want to be friends with the Jews. We want to support the Jewish people. We love the Jewish people. We want to bless the Jewish people. This was just something astounding to me. This was now 40 years ago. No, 35 years ago, maybe not something like that. It was, it was a long enough time ago. This was like one of the first, it wasn't the first Jewish organi Christian organization in Jerusalem. 
but none of them were very big and there wasn't internet and there wasn't email. And so this was like finding something like this was a, was a true find. But little by little, I decided this is something that I want to look into more because as I said, in, in, in the kind of kindergarten, one of the things that I learned was if somebody extends a hand of friendship to you, you grasp that hand and you return that shake. So that is what I was looking to do with such Christians. And uh, again, the, the internet started happening and then Facebook and then stuff like this. And little by little, I became more and more interested in, and until I realized that this is not just some, some cool hobby, but it's, I think, an important, really of epical, biblical proportion of uh, what it, we need in this world today. You know, in our time, we had this song when I was growing up, what the world needs now is love, just love. That's the only thing there's not too much of. And certainly between the Jews and the Christians, there's a lot of love lost, or not a lot, whatever. There's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, of, of history that uh, keeps Christians and Jews separate. And so, and so uh, finding all of these Christians who had woken up, some of them even three and four generations, recognizing, no, Jews are the people of God. Uh, and that can mean a few different things. And Jews are the favored of God. And the Jews are just nice people. So like, why not? Let's, let's be friends. So I, from both from the Christian side and from the Jewish side, this is a, a tentative walk towards the middle of that bridge. I'm saying that now, describing what happened about 30, 40 years ago. But today, Baruch Hashem, there's many, many more people. Uh, there's hundreds of thousands and possibly millions of Christians who uh, would excitedly um, engage with Jews if they could um, at a level of mutual respect. I'm not talking about people who say, oh, great, here's not only somebody who uh, ha has not yet heard the, the gospel, but it's a Jew, so that's even better. I get more points for that. No, 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 I'm not talking about people like that. I'm talking about people who say, wow, this is just a nice person. I want to be friends with a nice person. This is, this is my opportunity on an individual level to repair the breach between the really um, theological cousins that Christians and Jews are, because we both uh, we both uh, accept the divinity of um, of the of the Old Testament. We both accept the the existence of the one true God. So. Uh, so we understand why we have history of fighting, but let's try to overcome that. And it, the, I think that that is something that God puts into each and every individual's heart because two people, one person that really is interested in the other person is, what, uh, who cares about this? I'd rather get back to my, uh, my Twitter or something like that. But, uh, but this is something that really appealed to me very, very much so. And I, up until now, I talked about the hundreds of thousands and maybe millions, maybe even tens of millions of Christians who God is putting this into their hearts. And on the, on the Jewish side, there are maybe even dozens of people. <laughs> now, it is true that we have many, much fewer Jews than Christians in general, but uh, we also have to remember where we're coming from. In other words, Christians who never met a Jew and were lucky enough not to grow up in an anti-Semitic uh, um, milieu, then it's somewhat natural for them to say, "Wow, look at those Israelis! They're they're good. They're the good guys." Or look at those uh, Nobel Prize, Peace Prize winners and Biology Prize winners. Wow, they they invented penicillin. They're really good guys. You know, there's a lot of reasons to like. Um, Jews, if you're not pre-programmed to hate them. But, but the problem is, is that there's very few Jews who aren't pre-programmed to hate Christians. <laughs> mm. and, and not because, oh, because those Christians are just horrible people. It's because they, they, we, got a, we got a history. 
Yeah. So, uh, so it's very difficult. But um, yeah. little by little, I see that as as my my goal here, as my as my mission, to bring uh, first of all to bring more Christians into this circle, and uh, especially to bring more and more Jews into this circle for Jews to overcome their innate inert fear of the other. Because ultimately, I think that's what the God wants. I think, I think that that is what God means when he wrote, uh, out of Zion shall come the Torah and the word of God from Jerusalem, and that uh, the nations shall go up to the house of the Lord uh, and, uh, and, and be as one. And, and on that day, the name of the Lord shall be one and he shall be one. And, and so that's, that's something that I'm focusing on while others of my friends are... Uh, are establishing startup uh, high-tech uh, companies and stuff like that. Uh, Gidon, this is uh, fascinating to hear you say this. Now, I'm one of those who grew up in the Bible Belt in the American South. My mm-hmm. contact with Jews was uh, my, my doctor, uh, the lawyers, some businessmen, the uh, Jewish deli across town. Um, and you, already our, knew four more, you already knew four more Jews than the majority of American Christians. Probably so. So, you know, not, not having grown up in, say, Brooklyn or Manhattan, um, all I knew was what I got in church, what I was encountering with my doctor, who was a very competent, very nice man. What? And, uh, yeah, it was a sympathetic upbringing. So I, too, what was... Did you hear about, what did you hear in your church? Oh. Uh, in my Southern Baptist church, our pastor made it a point to preach from the whole Bible. So I remember one of his sermons, my favorite, I think, was called Then Came Sennacherib. And he preached from Second Chronicles about King Hezekiah, and he had done all these great things in reform for the kingdom of Judah, and then along came the Assyrian king and, uh, and uh, invaded. So mm-hmm. he's, he's preaching like this, giving us lessons from Jewish history. Yes. And, uh, and we're also hearing as I'm growing up in Sunday school, uh, you know, at the time of the Six Day War, the of Yom course. Kippur War, and we are seeing fascinating things happening in Israel. And it wasn't long before when I'm getting to high school in a Christian high school that, all, that I'm beginning to hear, this is how prophecy is being fulfilled in the end times. There you go. Yeah. So what you're describing from the Jewish perspective, I was getting from the Christian perspective. And just my impression, I'd like to get your thoughts on this now, is, yeah, we have some profound differences. But it seems to me one of the greatest tests that God has for his people is whether we can set aside those differences to come together in mutual respect and trust him to work out the things we cannot. Okay. Am I, can I say something after that? That's exactly Please what do. I believe. <laughs> yeah. People um, love to uh, emphasize we have such profound differences, and I also talk about that. But I can think of two people who have a tremendously amount of profound differences. They're a man and a woman. Right. And they're getting together and, and they're overcoming their differences and they're sticking through it even if those, those differences cause friction. But ultimately, that is the goal of, the, the, of God, that man shall leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife or something like that. I know it better in Hebrew. So that is a model for the entire world. God... God um, didn't create humans, the human race, for us to destroy each other and to hate each other. He created us in order to love each other, just like he loves us. Except that he didn't create us, um, uh, you know, battery, battery included, so everything just works as easy as it can, and then there's no point in us overcoming the difficulties of the world. No, that's the point of God. God wanted, I, I believe, that God wanted to make things challenging for us so we could feel that we had overcome those challenges. And I think that this greatest challenge of all is for all of mankind to overcome the ultimately petty differences 
and and hatreds and and grow up and not and not uh, fight like little kids anymore. Just just can you all play nice? And that's something that uh, we got to work on. And and especially today, where it seems to me, today meaning like the past few decades and not more, that that uh, uh, a great the 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 great enemy that we have is uh, the enemy that we share, and that is. Um, a, a extreme uh, Islam and the uh, the terror th that they are trying to do uh, from their perspective. And I have a lot of uh, Muslim friends who uh, shake or I, I don't not really like. I have some Muslim friends that that uh, shake away from that and they, they feel really bad about that. And uh, but if we're so busy and I'm talking to my uh, Jewish friends here, if we're so busy uh, saying, well, I can't be friends with Christians. I have two thousand years of history that I have to keep up with then we're not going to be able to overcome this. And again, overcoming, I don't think that overcoming means erasing, uh, you know, d d destroying the enemy. Uh, if we have to do that, we have to do part of it. But ultimately, and this is what Prime Minister Netanyahu always says about Iran, we don't hate the Iranian people. We, we are at war with this Iranian leadership that has to be replaced, that has to be, that has to be conquered. But ultimately, the, the, the people of Israel, the people of Iran, the people of, of Israel and the people of uh, Ishmael, we have to be together ultimately. And that is something that we have to work on. And that is something that you and I, Christians and Jews, have to try to work on together. That's, that's what I think. And instead, we're too busy trying to say, oh, no, no, I can't work with them. I can't work with them. Go for mm. it. Yeah. Well, which brings us back to root source. And yeah. Thank How you. did it happen, and what was your vision? So I had a few um, a ideas that I was I was thinking about uh, working on. I was working in in technical writing and computers uh, before that, and I left that because I said I want to figure out what I want to do. Uh, that that in order to spend more time and really do something in this uh, mission, in this vision and mission that I have of of building a bridge between Christians and Jews. And I would speak to groups of Christians that I found usually over the internet, email and stuff like that, who would say, sure, we'll be happy for you to come and talk to us. So one group I remember, I don't know if you know her, was Christine Darg. Yes. She's, I think she's from over there near Virginia or something like that. And uh, so she would bring groups to Israel two or three times a year. And so once or twice a year, she would invite me to speak to the group. It was always a lot of fun. So one year I decided, you know what? One time I said, what I want to do, I love going to, I love talking to, to Christine and her groups and similar groups, but it happens once, twice a year. You know, I can't really make, can't go to the, to the grocery store with that. How about if I go online, because the internet already is a thing, and I teach online, and somehow we'll figure out how people will pay me to teach them. And that way I don't have to wait for, um, for a dozen people to come as a group to Jerusalem. And I wasn't even living in Jerusalem, so it's, so it's uh, difficult technically. But we'll figure out some way to have a, a Zoom meeting or a YouTube or whatever, one of those newfangled video uh, internet things. And uh, there will be a, a school. I will be the teacher, and, pe and people will be my students, and everybody will be happy. They'll be happy to, to, to pay for this content, to pay for this engagement, this, this relationship. And I'll be happy to provide it and to be the other side. So I shared this with that group. And I said, I, my idea is an online yeshiva for Christians. And, uh, and the, the group just said, hallelujah. This is what we've been waiting for. And one gentleman stepped up and said, I'd like to be your first student. I said, great. And he said, I'd even like to, to help you out with this. And that was my friend, Bob O'Dell, our friend, who, uh, who had just uh, had an exit from a high-tech company and he was figuring out what he wanted to do. God had told him that he was to help Jews with businesses. So who am I to disagree? So, uh, so we worked on this plan. We expanded it a bit to include other teachers. And ultimately, Root Source was birthed. That was, I think, uh, 2015, something like that. Maybe 2014, I remember. 
And over the time, we've been uh, very blessed and we've had over 500 people paying a monthly uh, tuition to, um, to uh, access our, our lessons. We've had about uh, a dozen Jewish teachers, each one teaching a different topic. Um, a, women in the Bible, the temple, uh, in, uh, uh, introduction to Hebrew, Jewish history, Jewish prayer, topics that my teachers were interested in teaching that, that many Christians are interested in, in studying. So that's, that's a, a good meeting of the minds. And we've uh, been able to reach over 50,000 people on our free weekly newsletter as well. So uh, recently we're, uh, we've ot, 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 finished uh, making the switch over from that uh, pay model to a free model where anybody who will uh, sign up as a member just by giving us their e internet addre uh, email address, they will be able to access all of the thousand plus lessons that we have recorded and uh, for free. And we will, uh, we'll, as I've learned, um, put, our ha put our lives into God's hand and believe that people who will uh, hear of us and recognize what Root Source is about, about uh, Orthodox Israeli Jews engaging with Christians around the world in order to study together the common roots of our faiths and to build bridges between us. This is the kind of stuff that many Christians that I know are, you know, they're absolutely astounded about and, and say, give me more, give me more. This, they, they, like me, believe that this is uh, a main end times prophecy that is coming true and they can be part of it. So I think that we're going to be able to um, not only offer this for free to, to people because uh, there are a lot of people who, saw, who send me emails, uh, dear Gideon, I'd love to subscribe, but I just can't afford it. Uh, sent from my iPhone. I love that. I love seeing that. <laughs> uh, but um, but the, not only in the United States and other English-speaking countries, but in places like Africa and China, people where people can barely rub together a few dollars over the year, if we'll be able to reach places like that, that is truly from out of Jerusalem comes the word of God. So that is, I'm really excited about that kind of stuff. It is exciting. And uh, just to mention your website, it is root-source.com, root-source.com. And you have a very impressive array of teachers. Um, and that's only the beginning, Bezrat Hashem. Uh, Bezrat Hashem, yes. Uh, now, as for the fascination of the Jewish perspectives, Jewish learning for us Christians, I can testify to that. Uh, it's been I don't know, close to 20 years that I became aware that, you know, when, when Paul wrote in Romans that the Jews are given the oracles of God, it's true. You've been looking at this for 3,000 years or more. Mm -hmm. So if we want to go to a primary source and find out what's been the teaching on it, what's been the thinking on it for a long time, why not go to the Jews? And it's something that the church writ large has missed. Yes. So um, it's very exciting, but let's let's get to the current thing that you and I both are touching, and that's the nation's ninth of Av. Yes. Uh, how did how did Root Source get involved, and uh, what do you what do you hope to see from it? Let's see. <laughs> um, what what I remember uh, vaguely, because I'm not thinking about this so much right now. We're in the middle of all this Corona stuff, and me trying to get a new Facebook what website out. So. But the root source, again, Bob Odell, my partner and I, we're, we've become very, very good friends and we speak very, very frequently, two or three times a week. And one day Bob reminded me or uh, emphasized to me that something that he had done in the past, like years and years ago, or maybe just years ago, was he did research about anti-Semitism. And he uh, started recording for himself an Excel spreadsheet of anti-Semitic acts committed by Christians against Jews, of course, throughout the centuries. He'd read a, a bunch of books. Every time he came across something, he wrote in his spreadsheet, 
uh, this such and such happened in, in this year, this many Jews were killed, this many, this, whatever. So after uh, a few months of this, he realized that he had a few hundred rows, a few hundred recording, recordings of uh, anti-Semitic acts against Jews by Christians or by the church uh, in history. And he then learned about uh, uh, Ninth of Av, which is the Jewish Memorial Day of Historic Calamity of, uh, of the Jews. It's the day, uh, the ninth day of the month of Av, which is uh, uh, the 10th, um, 11th month, month of, the, of the modern Jewish calendar. It comes out in July or August or something like that. So we're talking about the ninth day of uh, this 11th month. Uh, Av Elul, it's the 11th month, Tisha B'Av. And so what you have is uh, the ninth day of the 11th month. It's the Jews 9-11, basically. And uh, so uh, the Jews uh, remember uh, uh, all of the calamities that happened to them by fasting on this day. We remember the destruction of both the first and the second temples that uh, happened on this day in uh in uh, history and as as well as numerous other uh things that happened on this day and so bob said wow if the jews are doing that if they're fasting so i will try to do that as well i will take my list and i will meditate on each line for one minute and i you know i won't break for eating so i will fast so he had about 500 items on his list now, 500 minutes is, is close to 12 hours, like 10 hours. And that's already longer than a whole day. Anyway, he said that he, would, he reviewed, by the time he got to about two or three hours of this, he became physically ill and was unable to continue. So uh, he told me about this. And, and somehow we came up with this idea that we would um, both publish his list uh, in a, at the time, we, we came up with this idea as we usually do too late. So we, we published it in a somewhat rudimentary form. And we also came up with this idea that we would um, put some sort of a declaration of, of uh, contri contrition, of sadness, of, of, of re uh, um, a repentance, that any Christian who would want to sign this, this declaration of, we recognize the, the uh, tragic history of Jews and Christians, and we uh, feel sorry for that, and we we were, uh, are signing our names to this declaration that will be presented to a uh, um, uh, representative of the Jewish people. And I'm also, we didn't talk about it so much in this uh, interview, but I'm also a member of the Central Committee of the Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party. So I'm uh, pretty well connected to the Knesset members. So that year, this was, I think, two years ago, close to two years ago, uh, right? Um, we uh, presented this list uh, and this, this uh, signed uh, petition, if you will, the signed declaration to the Speaker of the Knesset, to um, a, 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 no, Ed, uh, Yuli Edelstein. And we ga I gathered a bunch of my uh, Christian friends who live in Jerusalem, and so we sent that we came there as a delegation, and it was a very nice thing. When we were done with that, we reported about it on the Root Source blog, and a gentleman in—I'm uh, not sure if he was in New Zealand, maybe he was from New Zealand. They lived in San Diego or something like that, and he—he uh, he said, "I've been doing the same thing as as Bob. I've also uh, um, started making such a list." And so Bob, his name was Ray Ray Montgomery. They came together and um, built up this list of theirs till we finally um, formatted it and 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 uh, made it much bigger. And we published it as the list. What was the name of the whole name of the the list? Um, a, 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 an encyclopedia of Christian atrocities committed against the Jews throughout history, with close to a thousand such uh, events. It's about a 500 page long, 500 
page long book. And uh, so we took this, we took this book, um, uh, Bob and Ray and uh, Laura, who I'll get up to in a minute, who's uh, helping to lead the Ninth of Av uh, uh, pro projects. Um, they also reached out to a few Christian leaders and they bu bu built up a book of 40 uh, called um, the, uh, it's not called the companion. We call it the companion. It's um, a, a book of 40, 40 days of prayer, I think is the name of the book. Um, I don't have one, a copy of it right next to me over here too bad. Over there, I don't want to move the frame. Uh, for, uh, uh, 40 days of, of uh, prayer and of repentance. Uh, leading up to the ninth of Av for readers, Christian readers, to want to take this upon themselves to uh, review some of the tragic events of history and to um, map them and connect them with uh, a, uh, this day of, this prayer of that day that was written in this, uh, in this book. And of course, they had their, their own prayers. So last year this started, both of these books were published, uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of copies were sold around the world. And uh, we also did a, um, a, 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 a program in Israel where some two or three dozen Christians came to Israel and participated in the ninth of Av with, together with uh, some Jews. So I was there. One of one of our teachers, Rabbi Chaim Eisen, was there. My wife was there. So uh, it was a uh, it was a a a, a, bil a bridge building event at the sorest spot in Jewish in Jewish and Christian history, really. Because when we're talking, you know, again, Tisha B'Av is mostly about the destruction of the temple. That's when it all started. It really started way before. When the uh, when the spies came back, where the spies that jo that Moses sent uh, came back, and ten out of twelve of the spies gave an evil report about the land of Israel, so that tr that um, uh, calcul was calculated to be the ninth of Av as well, and that was when God uh, when God uh, swore that He would punish the Jews for this, the people of Israel. Um, so, but so. Here were, but but of course, for two thousand years, uh, all, all most of uh, the history of anti-Semitism has been the history of of, of Christian anti-Semitism. So there's a lot to, um, to to learn, a lot to worry, to to be to feel right about. And uh, this was the first time in Israel that Christians and Jews put together in order to. Uh, learn together what this means for each and every one of us. And uh, uh, so I'm like a, a, an advisor to the team who's putting this together. Uh, and I'm again an advisor this year. And I will pass the mic over to you, Al, to tell us what's going on. And while you're at it, remind me and uh, update me. <laughs> well, our, our current events uh, are planned for uh, July 28th to August 5th in Israel. Um, of course, with the current global health situation, uh, we're not sure exactly how much we'll be able to do. Um, but we've had uh, last year companion events in the nations, mm -hmm. uh, Christians meeting in their local assemblies and uh, for the day of fasting to Shabbat. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a 26-hour marathon prayer phone call. And... Uh, mm -hmm. This is something that uh, in, in the Christian prayer movement has um, come about as a, a very powerful tool of using teleconferencing, video teleconferencing to connect uh, people in prayer. And so that's what we did last year. I, I was one of the facilitators. Yeah. We will certainly have those things as well. We still intend to have an event in, uh, in Jerusalem, the uh, Registration is open at uh, 9-av.com. But, you know, Gidon, uh, even with the current health crisis, uh, we still can take this as a time of preparation, looking forward, hopefully, and soon and in our day, when mm -hmm. all nations go up to Zion, to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Because that is the center of the world. That is the place where the God of Israel put his name. That's right. Yeah. 
And uh, as we're coming to the end of our, our time together, I do want to ask you what you hope to see from this Ninth of Av initiative. I am uh, hoping and challenging the Ninth of Av uh, as well that we will be able to reach thousands and even tens of thousands of Christians around the world with the message of, uh, of hope and of brotherhood that we are working on. And uh, I uh, hope that that will uh, then become a uh, challenge to me because, as we know, in uh, the verse of uh, Zechariah 8.23, on those days, um, uh, 10 people from all of the nations of the world will grab on to the, uh, the, 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 the clothing, of uh, the cloak of, uh, of a Jewish person and say, uh, we want to go with you because we have heard God is with you. And uh, we want to, and that will be a challenge for me to uh, bring more Jews in because uh, we need a lot more Jews when, when we've got all of these members of the nations around the world. So I am hoping that we will uh, still be able to, that God will not, uh, uh, you know, if God decides to push his timetable up uh, faster than me, first of all, that will not be, Surprising at all, God is much less of a procrastinator than I am. Uh, but uh, if <laughs> I'll, I'll take that as a compliment. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I hope that uh, we will be able to bring more and more people to recognize, both Jews and Christians, that this is what uh, God wants. And it is up to us to uh, stand up, both of us, all of us, uh, to this challenge. And uh, if we will uh, meet God's challenge, we will benefit uh, to see God's uh, rewards that uh, he uh, holds in place for those who uh, love him and to do his wishes, do his will. Amen. We are all looking forward to that age of peace that when God himself is ruling from, from Jerusalem. So uh, this is part of it. Well, Gidon Ariel, thank you very much for what you are doing to hasten that day and uh, look forward to seeing you soon in Jerusalem. Amen. And until then, here on Zoom. Amen. <laughs> shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Thank you for joining us today. To learn more about the nation's Ninth of Av and how you can be part of the conversation, visit us at 9-av.com.